um, Ghanaian American, and my mother is Ghanaian. She's from Accra Pong, the eastern region. At least from what I've seen, the women are taught to be very like, you know, you stay at home and you find a husband and, you know, like you achieve, but like not too much. Like you kind of keep these boundaries. And my mom was very much like, that's not for me. When she's in New York, that's where she meets my dad. Long story short, like, you know, she gets pregnant and he's like, I don't want to have a kid. And then he dips. And that's their relationship. So essentially my mom now has this kid and the whole family is like, look at you. Like, look what you've done. Like you've gone to, like you want to travel, you want to see the world. But oh, long story short, like the dude that like, you wanted to end up with is not even here. Like, what? So hence, like, that's where all this pressure comes in. So like, I need to groom you to be great and to be on top of everything because like, I placed a bet and I don't want my bet to fail. Growing up, I lived in several different places with my mom because she was a full-time nurse. So she would either be a home health aide where she lived in the, uh, property with that person and I would be home sometimes maybe three four five six months at a time you know by myself and I think it made our relationship tough because like you want to be angry but it's like but how can you be angry because this person is trying to keep you alive and like they're doing all this for you so it was my junior year of high school and I had gotten a call in like my AP Lang class to go to the, my guidance counselor's office you know there's this woman sitting on the side and then she says, your mother's in the hospital, like she had a mental breakdown and we're taking you away. They take me to this place that's called an anchor house and it's for like temporary housing for children who have like uh, nowhere to go or have been removed from the home. So then I start calling the Department of Family Services, I start calling the social worker. I didn't necessarily know specifically what that was. I just remember feeling like, well, mental breakdown is not a physical ailments. I was like, that must run pretty deep then to disable a person. So my mom, my freshman year, fall semester, uh, said, called me and said like she got a phone call from someone in my high school or something that said, oh, your son is like out in California. He's like gay and yada, yada, yada. Because at that point I, I was out in California. So I was like, we're not going back. So I was like, yeah, like it's true. A couple months later, I get a letter. It's like, I think November-ish. In the letter, she said, um, like, if anyone asks, like, you don't have a mother, like, you know, I have no son, like, this is the life you've chosen, um, and that, like, you're disowned. And, you know, she quoted a couple, like, Bible scriptures. When I saw the letter, I'm standing in my, like, freshman dorm corridor, and the walls just kind of felt like they were closing in, and, like, everything just became really black. And I remember, like, you know, I, I just fall and I just start crying. And I felt betrayed because I was, like, I am trying to do so much and, like, thinking about you and something that, like, is involuntarily just a part of my life. Like, this is how you're responding to it. So my mom calls me in my second semester of freshman year. She says she knows what she did was unkind. She says sorry. I was still upset, but I... I wasn't, I cared more to have my mom back than to be upset. So one of the reasons why I'm not talking to my mother now is because in 2018 May, I get a phone call. In that call, she was like, okay, so did you tell your dad you were gay? And I was like, yeah. And then she was like, why did you tell him? Like, why don't you listen to me? Like, you know, and then she starts rattling off. Like, you know, he's saying all this stuff in town. And like, and I was like, honestly, to be frank, don't really care if he is telling all these people. And even if he is smearing my name, like not my business. Like, I don't know these people. I could feel it escalating. So then I say like, I love you. And that's what I care about. Like, that's the crux of all of this. Like, I don't want us to lose that, you know, trying to deescalate the situation. And then after I say that, she says, you don't love me. And then <laughs> I was like, I laugh about it now, but I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I became so livid, like a chasm just opened up. And like, after that, I made a decision to myself. I was like, I'm going to set this boundary. I'm not going to talk to you because I'm so used to being the one to call back and like try and amend things and try and like fix things. Even when like we've had arguments in the past, like I'm always like, Michael, she's your mom, you know better, like she's worked really hard, like, you know, come on. I feel like this is a really important time for the two of us. I think it's a good time to individuate. And in the future, I have hope and faith. I have hope in the dream that like things will be well. And I have faith though that like, I'll be okay.
and that she'll be okay, regardless of like whether things end up how I want them to be or how she wants them to be.